Trump takes pleasure in attracting a stellar list of speakers that address today's most relevant issues. The club's place as a refuge for rich discussion and networking has never wavered after 123 seasons. We are dedicated to encouraging debate on the issues that matter to this city, this province, and this country. The Canadian club is one of the most important podium anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic, political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Canadian Club of Toronto. Uh, my name is David Simmons. I'm your president-elect of the club. I appreciate you making time to be with us today. Alice Don has transformed itself from an old school crane and concrete contractor into an entrepreneurial pioneer, striving to change the way construction projects are conceived, executed, and maintained over their lifetime. Today, we're joined by Jeff Smith, CEO of Alice Don, to hear about how the company got here, how it very nearly didn't, and why employee capitalism is a key to a prosperous future. Before we dive into the topic, I wanted to give you a couple of uh, tips on how to participate today. You can click here to stream, which is a button that helps you find uh, a better connection if your internet is slow. Your video quality may decrease, but the audio quality will remain strong. Once you click the questions tab, you can enter your questions in the window and they'll be sent to our moderator. If you need help, click the request help button located at the bottom right center page. I want to thank today's sponsors, the Carpenters, Carpenters District Council of Ontario and KPMG. The Canadian Club is a nonprofit organization. We've been getting together for over 124 years, and it's because of our sponsors that we can continue to do that uh, today. We're grateful that you're here helping us have this discussion. Now, let me briefly introduce our speaker. Jeff is president and CEO of Alistan, an employee-owned company, $5 billion a year construction services and technology operation. Mr. Smith joined the company in 1983 and became president and CEO in 96 after leading various parts of the business. Jeff is credited with reinventing the company as a cradle to grave services provider with guaranteed performance outcomes through its capital services, facilities management, and sustainable building divisions. After his remarks, Jeff will be joined in conversation by the Logic's Catherine, Catherine McIntyre. One of the club's traditions is to toast uh, Canada uh, and it's especially important that we continue to do that in the times that we're in. So if you can, please join me with a toast to Canada. To Canada. Yeah. Canada's podium of record is now yours. Thank you very much, David. And it's uh, nice to be here all by myself, of course. This is about the weirdest thing ever. No networking uh, allowed today, anyone. And of course, I'm just a warm up act for uh, Premier Ford at one o'clock. So this is probably the most fun any of us will have today. Uh, I'm going to, I'm not going to talk about the history. I'm happy to answer any questions. I mean, afterwards, because we have about 40 minutes, hopefully, let's really have at it. I'm just gonna, going to make four points, if I may, and start off with a bit about what I'm going to call the soul of Elliston, because I, I think it's a bit of a unique place. And I'm going to start by saying I don't think this will be like other leaders' speeches you've seen, and, I, and uh, you know I don't criticize anybody, but the, the ones I've seen, leaders like to political business, like to convince you, you know, very sensibly uh, that they've got it all together, right? They've got the right strategy, they've got the right structure, they've got the right systems, they've execution, they've got it all mapped out. I really like that at Elliston. And I, I have to say, uh, I've got bankers watching that loan us money and I've got bonding companies. To do. 
So don't panic. We, we have execution. We're good at execution. We, we have good systems and we have a pretty, we, uh, we got a strategy. I think we got about 12 strategy. I got my board bonkers, but we don't pretend for a minute here that we've got it all mapped out, even into the next uh, few quarters, because we frankly don't think we have any idea what will happen next. We like the words fast, fluid, and flexible, uh, which I think is a polite way of saying that our priorities are subject to, to pretty quick reinterpretation. And we continually expose ourselves, I think more than a lot of companies, to uh, the human frailties of the people who work here which is a nice way of saying we make a lot of mistakes and we don't, we don't care about that. We're doing okay. As David said, we'll do, we'll be short of 5 billion this year because of COVID, but we're doing okay. I wanted to, I wanted to start that way for a, a couple of reasons. First of all, I'm hoping that there are some young people watching today and I'm thinking, I'm worried actually, that they may be looking at Ellis Dawn and they see the big signs we put up everywhere and they're thinking, wow, you know, that's a, that a, a successful company. I'd like to know their secret. I'm going to watch Jeff Smith, see if I can find the secret. Uh, there is no secret. Um, anyone can do this. I would say to anybody who's young, just keep really using your brain as much as you can. Never work for anyone or any company that tries to reduce you to a system input. And just, you know, get into that a little bit and just keep, Pounding away, if you had to ask me one word that was the reason for Ellis Don's success, uh, the word I would pick is resilience. We just kept, we just kept pounding away for nearly, uh, I think, 70 years now. Uh, but the, the other reason I wanted to start that way is actually more important. In, in my experience, policies and systems are important. We have our share here, but too many systems, too many policies, too rigid a view of the future is, in my view, the death of innovation and the end of the entrepreneurial adventure, which we're trying to stay on here. If you tell people what to do, that's what they will do. And believe you me, at Elliston, I know about your companies, we have tried the innovation councils, we have tried the electronic suggestion boxes, cash incentives for new ideas, We've read all the Harvard Business articles on cooperation and laser-focused strategy, and we've thought about the government policies like innovation super clusters. And I'm going to be a little uh, obnoxious here and say, in our experience, that doesn't work. I haven't found any of those things work. I'm sorry, but I haven't. It's just here's what's worked for us. If you make your company's mission entirely about the people who work here, not the shareholders not the clients, not, you know, construction excellence, whatever that is. And if you're willing to say that out loud, which I'm trying to do here, obviously, and then if you hire the smartest people you possibly can get and you give them as much freedom as you can stand until it makes you a bit uh, tight in the stomach, and if you give them all the information that you can possibly stand, knowing that your competitors and everybody will get it, not confidential information, but company information, and then get out of the way. That's what's worked for us, and that's what we talk about all the time here. Let me boast a little bit, but just for a little bit and just for, for a reason I'll get to, uh, as David said, we're no longer just a construction company. We have a capital services arm, which is really a project finance division, and they have four different uh, profit strategies. We started out financing PPPs, but, and I think I understand two of them, uh, although they send me a lot of memos. We have a smart buildings division, which I'll touch on later because it's really about the future. We have a digital strategy, which may or may not work, but is probably the future, the key to our future anyway. We have manufacturing, we have mass timber, we have, a, we have an insurance agency, and I'll miss some, but here's my point. None of those, not one of those ideas came out of an innovation committee, uh, you know, an MBA strategy matrix, a corporate retreat, and they obviously didn't come from the CEO. All this really cool stuff happened because somebody at this place put up their hand and said, hey, I've got an idea. And I got to tell you a story because sometimes they don't even tell me about their ideas. The happiest moment of my life at Ella's done. 
I went downstairs, this is about six, seven years ago, and I was looking for the head of our construction sciences department, George Cheritu is his name, at the time, and, I, and he wasn't there. And I said, where's George? And everybody in the department said, he's not here. And I said, I'm, you know, I, I'm a pretty perceptive guy. When's he going to get back? And they said, in two weeks. And I said, well, that's kind of a long lunch. Where, where, where the hell is he? They said, he's in China. I said, well, we don't have anything going in China. What's he doing in China? They said, well, the, the new formwork system that he invented, he went over to China to see if he can get it manufactured over there. And being the, on top of it CEO that I am, I said, what new formwork system that he manufactured? He was just off doing it. Uh, and if, you, if, I, if I wanted anything on my gravestone, I think I put that story on my gravestone. I just think I just was so happy when I was walking back upstairs. So I'm going to tell you, it, I'm going to suggest to you as politely as I can, that if innovation is the key to Canada's future prosperity, as we all say it is, and then I think I've just told you everything I've unlearned about it. Here's something I, I think I've learned about it. The question is, how do you get that superintendent, that junior coordinator, that whoever it is in the company to put up their hand in the first place? Because we all know that's the hardest part. They have great ideas, but they don't, for some reason, they don't want to bring them forward. And the best answer that we've come up with here is that we've let everybody know that we trust them. We talk about it and talk about it. And more importantly, I think they'll put up their hand if they know the people around them trust them and have their back to come up with stupid ideas, you know, to try new things, to, to go to China. And that's really scary stuff because policies and procedures and approvals are all very comfortable. They may be mediocre, but at least they're consistent. And most importantly, they absolve everybody from blame. I just followed the, you know, I just did what you told me to do. And like I said, if you tell them what to do, they'll, they'll do it. And, and the other thing is, as I said earlier, we get a lot of mistakes. And we get some profound uh, screw-ups, people, people doing things because we trust them rather than because they were told what to do. Uh, but we get some flashes of brilliance. I think, uh, I think a little bit of chaos is okay if people trust one another. So uh, as it's the best we've done on innovation around here. But here's the second reason I think people put up their hands, and this is my second point that I'm going to make, around here anyway, in my experience. It's because they own the joint. Uh, I'm sort of a, an unapologetic corporate socialist. I'm a champion of free enterprise, but I've stopped calling myself a capitalist because uh, I don't really understand why capital is on top. Why does equity get all the money? Who, who made that rule? I, I don't agree with that rule. I just, I just don't. I'd argue this. We'd all agree that uh, all your employees need to be paid competitively, properly. And we'd, we'd all agree that equity requires a proper return on investment. Of course they do. But what do you do when the returns of the company are prosperous enough that they exceed both of those norms? Most companies, equity gets it. I think, frankly, it should be split between the equity that enabled those great gains and the people who actually earned that money. I'll tell you my proudest three moments of this company pretty quickly. In 1996, my brothers and sisters and I uh, bought the company from, from my dad. And frankly, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry if this seems so promotional, but more about them than about me. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. It was an act of entrepreneurial courage. They and I didn't have a lot of money. Uh, and we and we just did it. But more importantly, four years later in 2000, we froze that equity such as it was. It wasn't very much, about 20 million bucks, uh, and gave half, 45% of the uh, company to the employees for free, going forward, for free. And then in February 2020, the third one was, was just a year ago almost. Uh, we signed a deal with the employees to sell them the rest of the company at book value, over time. So we'll be 100% employee-owned. Now, I get that this is not a new idea. Hell, our, our main competitor did it a generation ago. And, uh, and other people do it. Private equity gets it, right? They, they love to give management teams a piece of the equity because they know that it enlarges the circle. I'm not saying this is new. I am saying it's a terrific 
uh, idea around building prosperity, and I'm going to suggest to you, uh, maybe a little belligerently, that our governments don't get it yet. Uh, the U.S. has a hugely successful uh, ESOP program, Employee Share Ownership Program. The U.K. has something called EOT. I think it stands for Employee, Employee Ownership Trust. Uh, Canadian governments have nothing. For me, if we want to increase productivity, innovation, and prosperity in this company, if we want to keep the money here in Canada rather than in the pockets of big multinational uh, shareholders, I would forget the superclusters. I would copy the U.S. ESOP, ESOP structure. We could do it in a month. The benefits would be instantaneous. I don't know what's stopping us. And that, my friends, is my, as I said, my rather truculent offering to Canadian public policy for it today. My third point is, just let me talk about construction a, a little bit. But, you know, everybody thinks we're this dull, uh, boring, uh, meat and potatoes, lunch pail sort of business, and we're proud to be builders. We're proud to be doing all of that work. And we're, by the way, about 12 to 15 percent of the GDP. But everybody needs to know there's a lot of cool stuff going on here, and the future in construction is, is, tent, is mesmerizing. People ask, I always get asked this question, what will buildings look like in the future? How high will they go? Blah, 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 blah. blah. I said, that's the wrong question. The question is, what will they do? And what they will do is become organic, digital, of course. They will buildings, think about future buildings starting now, not as a structure, but as an experience. Buildings will aid and abet humanity if we do it right, by continually adapting over the life of the building to the changing needs of the users as life goes on. These buildings will be able to change with the users themselves. They'll be able to physically adapt themselves to the changing needs of the users rather, users rather than the uh, other way around. I think buildings will create new technologies. One of the coolest things, conversations I had a few years ago, we were looking at a, talking about design, and one of our people said, well, where in this boardroom, where are the avatars going to stand? Buildings are, are getting in gear with all this. What exists, I'm going to read just one part. What exists physically, the building itself, won't be replicated on a computer. I think it'll be, you got to think of it like the other way around. The, the, the reality will be more what's in your computer, and the replica will be the building. Think about that compared to what construction used to be. Then if you want to change anything, you change the, rec the, the reality in the computer, and the replica building changes itself. It's about the experience of the, of the building. That's where, we're, that's where we're headed. Construction is also, just so we're clear, going to, my voice is creaking, I don't know why, is going to contribute meaningfully to a carbon-free world, starting, starting right away. We will start and are starting to put up buildings that are consuming our carbon rather than generating it. Mass timber, energy creating materials, we need to mess with our supply chain in a, in a big hurry so that it so that it becomes waste-free. We create a lot of carbon. We're about to put an end to that. Join this industry. You can help save the planet. We've been, as an industry, I get it. We're ranked somewhere below hunters and farmers in terms of innovation. That's all going to change. We're going to do more to change this industry in the next 10 years than any other industry. So tell your kids to join us. We're having a hard time getting people. This is a pitch. I get it. This is a pitch. But we're going to be very cool. And we're going to be very digital, and we're going to help change the world. It's a, it's a great place. And this is my last point before I, I, I turn it over and, and get riddled, hopefully, with your tough questions, and Catherine McIntyre has her way with me. Let's be a little idealistic and a little ambitious. We live in a small country, but we know that we have this unique miracle of our collective values of tolerance and trustworthiness and welcoming. Canada punches above our weight, period, in terms of attracting great people to this country, in terms of being welcomed when we go abroad, and frankly, in terms of setting an example. Our values are our brand. 
And that's not naivety, and nor is it smug, in my view. I think it's a terrific opportunity. I'd argue strongly that it's a terrific opportunity, especially at this moment, for obvious reasons. It's a fact also. I didn't know this until it was pointed out to me. Businesses in Canada, business in Canada, is a trusted institution, a trusted group of people, more trusted than our politicians, more trusted than the media. People actually believe in this country that we're, we're out for the good of the country, and I believe that we are. We may be a little complacent, punch above our weight in some respects. We're not punching above our weight out there in the world stage in terms of being out there in the world, and the time is never better than right now. So just allow me to leave you with this in terms of building Canada and also being opportunistic business leaders in a world that is obviously growing colder. Over the holidays, I read this great article about George Schultz. Now, the older people will know that George Schultz he was on his 100th birthday. He was a big wheel at Bechtel. He was uh, Ronald Reagan's Secretary of State. He was nobody's fool, this guy. He was his big quote on his 100th birthday. I'm going to read it to you. He says, said, trust is the coin of the realm. When trust was in the room, whatever room that was, the family room, the school room, the locker room, the office room, the military room, good things happened. When trust was not in the room, good things did not happen. Everything else is details. I almost made me cry when I read it. I'm telling you, I got, I got emotional. I would argue this to all of you, that without losing our values, in fact, by trading even, even blatantly on our values, I think we, we can be more ambitious about Canada's place in the world and I think we can be more ambitious about what Canadian business can accomplish in the world and also at home. And it's not just about prosperity, although it is about that. We have every right to build as much prosperity as we possibly can here. But it's also against intolerance, it's against income inequity, poor innovation, a lack of mutual understanding, all of it. Some people tell me that trust equals weakness. Take it up with George Schultz, because no Chinese dictator ever kicks sand in his face. The guy nailed it. When there is trust in the room, good things happen. And the rest is just details. And I'm done. Thank you very much. Jeff, thank you for your remarks. Um, it's And thank you, everyone, who's joining the call. And, the Canadian Club for hosting this. Um, it, it's really a pleasure to be sitting with you virtually um, at this, you know, inflection point for the world, but for your industry. Um, you've been exposed to this business your entire life, and I'm just really interested to know more about what this moment feels like for you. Um, and there are a number of things um, in your talk just now that I, I want to pick up on and dig into a little bit more, but I want to start with this moment now. So we're 10 months into this global pandemic and um, I, I want to know, you know, how is the construction business in Canada feeling the effects of COVID-19? You know, you said you'll be okay, but you'll also be short $5 billion this year. So, so how have you had to adjust? Well, just in terms of COVID, and of course, we'll see what happens at one o'clock today. Uh, the construction industry has done, you know, re reasonably well. Uh, we've been hit. I worry, I don't worry so much about the big players. Elliston will, will muddle through. I worry about the much, we have a lot of thousands of subcontractors some of whom don't have that much more money than uh, the average restaurant. You know, they're, they're, they're living on, on the edge here. So, so it's a scary time. Uh, but so far, the industry, as you know, has been kept open. Uh, there hasn't been any relief uh, from this for the industry, so we're, we've been on our own. Um, but, but we're getting through it. There's been a lot of, excuse me, innovation. We've just spontaneous innovation on the ground where we didn't know things we could do because we like doing things the way we've always done them. And because of COVID, you can't for all the obvious reasons. Uh, hopefully we'll embrace those innovations and bring them back into the, 
into the into the uh, industry permanently. Um, and I'll tell you, I'm very proud of the fact that we've been able to keep our sites clean. There has been an increase in COVID uh, cases on our sites over the last couple of months, like everything, but the, the Toronto Public Health has looked at them and said, no, these are being brought to the sites. They're not being transmitted on the sites. So just like everybody, we're struggling, but if the industry continues to stay open, we'll we'll get through it, and, and in some respects, we'll come out stronger be, because of it in terms of the innovations and how good we are at, yeah, at know, what we do. I know, you know some companies are talking about staying remote permanently now after the pandemic, and I'm curious to know how this might affect the business long-term, even after after this is all done, the pandemic, um, you know, if companies and people are just used now to not working in offices or uh, going to event spaces as often. I, I, I'll be careful not to speak or advise any other companies on how they should run their shop. Obviously on our job sites, we have, we have what I'll call an industry frontline workers. They have to be at work. It is hard to social distance. Uh, and thousands and thousands of tradesmen are going out every day. They're not like nurses, but they're out there. Um, but a lot of what we do can be done at home. And we've always been very flexible with people. We don't really have a holiday policy. We say, take your holiday. We're not going to check on you. If you want to work from home because of your family, we don't care. We were like that before. But I'll say that uh, we want people back in the office. That's where the culture is built. We are a company, as you can tell, built almost entirely on our culture because we have no technology, just our culture. But we want people back here, and I'm saddened that we're back where we are and that we're sending, or we sent people home a couple of months ago as just as they started to come back. So for us, it's a, we'll, we'll be okay with it. We were always flexible, but I'd rather have people here because I don't see how to build this company with everybody at home. Just don't see it. Uh, I'm, so I have a question from um, someone in the audience here asking how you think buildings might change because of COVID-19 and, you know, just the physical structure and process of building companies and the experience of being in a building. How, how might that change? I think it will, I think it won't change as, and we're not seeing that much in change of uh, design, although it, I guess it's early yet. Uh, I'm not the one to answer the questions about whether the trend towards smaller condos are going to go towards bigger condos. Uh, we all, we all know about that uh, in the in terms of commercial and uh, retail as retail somebody else's guess is far better than than mine the big bet though I think in terms of uh, commercial office buildings is that things will pretty much return to normal uh, there'll be a vaccine there'll be we'll keep uh, fighting there may be less space I've heard different views one major bank CEO I heard him say that well, they'll only get about 60% of the people back, and they'll only be back 70% of the time. So do the math on how much space they require. But I'm of the other view. I think most people, most people at this company are anxious to get back, uh, and I don't see that much change. What I do see, and as we've seen in other industries, is the digitization of the buildings and the accommodation of space for all that will speed up. So this whole business that I talked about generally in terms of the building being an experience and design accommodating an experience rather than a physical space and protecting, protecting us from the, from the elements, which is what buildings have traditionally done, that will all be sped up. And I think everybody is wrestling with that now. So I think buildings will become more attentive to the people that use them rather than you go into a building and they say, here's your spot. What exactly that means, I'm not sure yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, just keeping on this idea of, you know, digital transformation um, in the industry, I, you know, you've talked before about how um, construction has been somewhat resistant to, to digital change, but that, you know, that's, that's changing. Um, I want to know a little bit more about how you see that digital transformation happening in practice? Like, what, what does that really look like? Well, let me, sorry, let me be a bit high level for a second. One of the things that we see changing and we're, we're trying to adapt to this uh, in the way we set up here at Ellis Dawn is I think software 
is merging in our industry. And what I mean by that is the software that is behind the design, obviously design is being digitized, is merging with the software that is running construction that is emerging very quickly, which in turn is merging with the software that manages the building. So if you're a client, I probably have some clients watching this who will be throwing things at the screen in a few minutes, but let me just throw this out there. If those things are merging, you're either, it changes the role of the contractor. And if you're not on top of, of the design and, if, and, and on top of that software and what's happening and how the building performs after you finish building it because, because your clients are going to demand that, then you're probably out of the game. So I think the way buildings get designed and the role of the contractor will change. I think you'll see much more design build. I think you'll see clients coming to us and saying, I want the building to look like this and I want it to perform this way for the next 30 years, take it away. And software is not only enabling uh, people like companies like Ellis Don to deliver that, it's demanding that we do. It's going to disrupt the supply chain. This whole business of going going out for three prices from all our subcontractors is going to change because I don't think that five years from now clients will, will be demanding that like they are now. They'll just say build it. Or they'll want to work with the mechanical, with the electrical directly as part of the team. The, 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 the way we have procured construction will change and therefore the industry model will be upended. And what we deliver, not just in terms of an experience, but in terms of a a functional design and a building and, and the guarantees for the life cycle of the building, all that's going to transform our industry and therefore it's going to transform the players in it like us. Does mm -hmm. that answer? Am I getting yeah, close yeah. to what you were asking? I'll just follow up on that. Who's controlling that, that nobody. piece of transformation right now? Well, nobody. There's this in construction to, there, there, we have these Silicon Valley companies, some of whom are probably watching, who say, well, I'm going to go in and, and listen, construction. Let's face it, you're a pretty inefficient industry. You haven't changed much in the last 50 years, for crying out loud. I'm going to introduce uh, digital into your industry, and, uh, and, and I'll introduce that, those productivity gains, and uh, frankly, I'll take a bunch of the money that generated, and good. And we're, we're, we're working with some of these companies, but we're also intending on disrupting ourselves. Mm. And let me just get to data really quickly. You may want to follow up on this. Construction is much more a knowledge industry than it is a building industry, you know, like a, a, a hands and tools industry. We have 50 subcontractors on every site. We have 10 consultants. We have clients. Building is really complex. That's why a few people are good at it. Uh, and it is data-driven. If you can predict failure, if you can even find the five major uh, reasons the projects fail, you can take over the world if you get it right. Silicon Valley gets this. We get it. We get it, too, and we're willing to take that risk. So, so that's what's happening on the ground, and that's, to answer your question, who's controlling it? Will the legacy companies disrupt themselves and control the software? Tell us, Don. Or will the software companies make commodities out of the legacy companies? If I can speak bluntly, mm -hmm. I guess we'll find out. Um, I'm, I'm interested to know whether... Well, first of all, I'm interested to know generally your thoughts on the Sidewalk Labs project that was proposed for the Toronto waterfront and whether you thought, you know, there was risk of this happening there where you'd have a large software company, technology company, Alphabet, coming in and commoditizing traditional construction and development firms. I'm not sure. That's a big question. And everybody who's watching this, will have a different view. The, to me, that was, uh, I, th I thought they were embracing the future. I thought that a lot of their ideas were uh, terrific in terms of the future of what a community should look like. Those communities are going to generate data. I think they frankly may even agree with me, that uh, with others, that they did a poor job of communicating and a, not as good a job at um, making sure that everybody understood that that data would be 99% to the benefit of the people who were generating that data. Um, Steve Diamond, who may or may not be watching this, the chair of Waterfront Toronto, would have his own views on this, but 
but listen, the future that they laid out is coming. It's a question of what you do with the data, who owns it and who gets to profit by it. Uh, I can't, you know, that's a, that's a debate that's being played out every day now. We have, if I can just quickly, in the construction industry, small or group, the, the client pays for the building. We build it. We put a lot of thought and construction science into it. The subs do a whole lot. Who owns the data? Who owns the data that's going to that's going to be the future of our construction industry? Uh, most people disagree with me, but I say we all do. Put all the data out there. And whoever can take advantage of it for whatever their purpose is, let them take advantage of it. I believe that, like I said, I'm a bit of a socialist. I believe that all the data should be communally owned. Um, I'm not sure Google shared that. I, I know that Ellis Dawn has a whole R&D department. Um, and my understanding is, you know, its job, at least in part, is to develop materials and techniques for the the construction process um, is is software. And correct me if I'm wrong on that. But is software something that the R&D department at Elliston um, is going to be placing more of a focus on? I'm not sure if I get your question exactly, but let me take a stab at it, and then you can tell me if I if I got it or not. We have a very big digital department, and it's and we need we need to make it uh, bigger. Uh, so all of the digitization around processes around information, around data, we've got a large and very capable team, because I, as I said earlier, I believe that's our future. The construction sciences here has traditionally been more about, uh, as you said, the materials, the methods, making sure that any innovation that we have inside the company gets shared around the company, make sure that any innovation that is created outside the company is brought into the company, and, and handing that off for free wherever we can, not just around the company, obviously, but to our clients. Uh, but as everything digitizes, uh, you know, 3D manufacturing, uh, uh, all of that stuff, obviously the two groups are working very closely together, uh, uh, visual construction and all of the, all of the, stuff, the, the, all of the stuff that's happening, all the pre-construction of mapping out uh, every stage and every detail of the construction. That's, that's the digital department, uh, the IT department working very closely with the construction sciences department. So they've got to speak each other's language. Is that is that what you were getting at? Yeah, yeah, that that does, that answers it. Um, I just want to go back for a second uh, to your remarks on you know transitioning the company to 100% employee owned business, and I'm interested to know, you know, Ellis Dawn had decided to, um, or the family had decided to sell its ownership in the company, why not go to the public markets with it rather than employees? Yeah, and why not go to private equity, right? We looked at both. One of it is, a, first of all, uh, uh, construction doesn't need a lot of, a lot of companies, in, so I shouldn't be so smug about employee ownership, right? Because construction properly run doesn't need external capital. Our, our projects, we can do $5 billion a year. It all sounds very impressive. But, in fact, the, the projects cash flow themselves. You need money to get surety bonds, but we can generally generate that. So we don't need, unless the, unless the family or a family wants to get out, a lot of external capital to grow a, to grow a, a business. Uh, but the family just decided, first of all, we've been telling the, the employees for a long time that it was our view that it should become a, an employee-owned company. We've gradually given them more and more shares more and more shares. Uh, it's a great way for the family to get out and continue to share in the profits, frankly, in an, over, in an ever declining balance over the next 10 years. That's how long it'll take. If you then, if you take a company public, you get all the money in immediately. I just think it changes the culture of the company. And everybody knows now we're focused on quarterly statements. Now we're focused on the short term. I wouldn't know what our quarterly statements would show. It's of no interest to me. It changes your priorities. It changes the way you operate. And because we don't need the money, we don't want to take the risk on the change in, uh, in culture. And frankly, if you say to the employees and the management team and all the employees, we have, like all the employees get shares, not just the management team, this is yours, rather than saying to them, frankly, this is private equity and the family's gone, uh, I just think you got a much better shot at building a great company, which is, an, which is our goal. 
then the family will be fine, right? They, they may have got more money up front if they'd have gone the other way. Uh, I, I know they know that they would have. Yeah. They'll probably get more money over a longer term if they go this way, and you've done a good thing. And that's why we did it. Simple as that. I have a question from a listener, viewer, uh, related to this. They ask, um, when you began to give more power to your employees, what other changes did you notice in the company, positive or negative? Well, it was an interesting thing. I'll tell you a quick story. We went through a crisis in, in uh, uh, the mid to late 90s, just when I came back to the company. Well, frankly, we were in bad shape. And uh, for a couple of years, we did nothing but try and stay in business. And we were just putting out fires every day. And, and when that was over, and I finally got a chance to sit back and think about something other than meeting payroll. Um, I noticed that nobody had left. None of the senior people had left. And think about it. Our competitors were trying to take them. The company was in bad shape. I knew it wasn't the leadership because my dad and I, frankly, were both responsible. We both screwed that up. We didn't provide great leadership. Why? Why didn't they leave? So I went and asked them. And the best answer I got, and it changed my life, was from a guy named Rick Magicomo, general superintendent, he said to me, Jeff, I got to tell you, we talked about it. We thought about it. This group, the, you know, the core group of eight or 10, probably at that time, people that you really needed. And he said, we decided that it was a good company, that we liked working together and that we could save it. So we decided to. And he didn't say it with any, he just said, that's what we decided. If you want to know the truth, I'll tell you the truth. I laughed and said, you think you might want to tell me? He said, whatever. And uh, I said, okay, carry on. And that's what, so it's not what else changed, is that changed everything for me. That set the culture for me. And now we say to people, you know what your job is? Go do your job. You're accountable. Don't lie. Go ahead and make mistakes. But you are accountable. You can't be a complete idiot here. Um, and you're accountable to the person who works beside you as much as you are to your boss. And then I would argue that that's what, change the company from one that was struggling to get by to one that frankly is doing reasonably well. Uh, that might be the answer to the next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What is the best advice you ever got as a business person? Go to where the trouble is. Tell me. About I got that. that from my dad. Hmm. He said, and I love to tell people, they say, tell me about your relationship with your dad. And I tell them I was, I'm a mama's boy. I tell the reflects my mother as much as my father. But, but my dad always said, the good stuff will take care of itself. You go to where the trouble is. And you make sure, because everybody knows there's trouble there. Your client knows, the other employees, everybody, take care of the trouble. So, first of all, not only will you take care of the trouble, but people will see you taking care of the trouble and they'll know that you got your priorities straight and you're not ignoring it. I would say that's the best advice. And talk to the person. Okay, the other thing I got from my dad is talk to the person on the front line. Don't ask the area manager who's going to ask the operations manager who's going to talk to the superintendent who's going to talk to the foreman. If you've got a problem in the foreman, you really want to know, go talk to the foreman. And if people uh, every, at this company, everybody talks to everybody. I don't care. And if people don't like it, too bad. So go to where the trouble is and talk to the person who can really solve it. I could tell you a couple of great anecdotes, but that's the best advice I ever got about running a, a construction company. Um, I guess there's been a lot of trouble in you know the business, um, in the industry, generally the economy, the world this year, this past year, um, and you know on top of dealing with the pandemic, Ellis Dawn has also had to confront, you know, some really ugly displays of racism within the organization this year. And I just want to touch on that a little bit. Um, you've said yourself, you know, that the industry is far too white, um, that it's rife with systemic racism and that that's gotten worse in recent years. Um, so how do you, how do you address this? How do you, you know, in the industry and specifically at your company, um, and how do you get Ellis Dawn to look more like the rest of Canada as you've committed to doing? So it's 
So first of all, I, I don't think I said, or I didn't mean to say that it's gotten worse in, in recent years. We've just become, certainly this summer we had, as a lot of people will know, we had nooses discovered hanging from a scissor lift on one of our job sites targeting two black employees. I just, I just never knew it was there. And I have one black, one black woman activist in, it was at the Michael Guerin Hospital in that community said, well, if you're the CEO of a construction company and you didn't know the, raci the racism existed on your sites, you must be pretty incompetent. And I said, yeah, I'll take that. I'll, ac I'll accept that because I didn't know. Well, no. And so the first thing we did was, was we faced it. Some, some co construction companies, frankly, hid, the no hid their nooses. We weren't the only ones. We were just the most public because we said there's a, there's a problem here. And I think that's the first thing you do. I think the first thing you do is you recognize that there's a problem publicly to your employees. And of course, your black employees who go, well, now at least, at least that guy, he seems to get it. I think that's a whole lot better than having somebody in the corner office who doesn't get it or having a management team, white management team that doesn't get it. And the second thing you do is you, is you talk to them and I've got a lot to learn, but I'm learning about systemic racism. If you'd have asked me last year ago what systemic racism was, I couldn't have answered the question. It's been explained to me now by, by people who are exposed to it. It's a lack of opportunity. If a bunch of white managers go off and play golf with a bunch of white managers, who's going to get promoted? And that's the way this industry has been, I think, more than other industries. So what you need to do is talk about your hiring policies, your promotion policies, your just face up to the relationships that deny and not just black employees, black members of the, but people of color and women. We're not so good with women either. Uh, and we need to, we need to fix all this. So you talk about it and you, and then you talk, and that's the conversations we're having now. Uh, systemic racism isn't going to be solved next month. So the next question is to answer your question, how do you get Ellis Don in the industry to look more like Canada? Do you have quotas? Uh, I don't know. We're, we're, we're debating that, and we've got we're debating it both in terms of gender and and race. You certainly have quotas coming in. It's when you get to the C-suite stuff, and what do you do? We're just we're just really working our way through it. But we've we've committed to do it uh, transparently. And I'll tell you that the committees we put together that are run by our employees and advising people like me are go are reporting directly to the board. Uh, that's happening at our board meeting. So you just effectively get everybody in a room together who's determined to solve it and say, how do, how do we solve it? And you measure your progress and you keep being transparent and I don't have all the answers. But we know we have a problem and we know we're going to fix it and we know we're going to make this industry look more like Canada. And I'll just say that my competitors are entirely in agreement with this. The union leaders are entirely in agreement with this. We're going to do it together. I'm pretty confident. And, and the last thing I'll say, sorry, it's really important, is that the, 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 the black employees that we have here, because anti-black racism has been the, the, the focus this summer, and, and I talked to those two. They were no stone employees who were targeted by it. I talked to one of them anyway who had the targeted by that noose, and he said, it's okay, Jeff. I get that you don't get it. I get that you didn't get it because you only hang around with white people. He said, he said I was mar I'm married to a white person. She didn't get it until she was married to me. She gets it now. And then he said, but now you get it. And now we'll see. I'm good with that. Um, I have a great question here from someone else in the audience. They say, many of us have chosen to build our startups in prop tech and circular economy in Europe and the US because of capital and opportunity. What would you suggest would be the carrot to bring this back to Canada and have startups Align with innovative companies like Elliston. Well, I, don't, I would say, well, let me boast a bit. We've worked in, in the U.S. and we've worked in Europe. And the construction companies in Canada are as good as anybody anywhere else. And I think we're more innovative. I don't, if you look at the top of this industry, it is world class, period. That sounds boastful, too bad. So I would say to those people, if, if you if you want to work with really great builders, this is the place to be. There is no shortage of appropriate and enough capital here 
if and I would say get involved more with the industry, which is easier to do if you're here than if you're sitting down in Silicon Valley hanging out with a bunch of tech startups talking to each other. Get closer to the front, get closer to the front line. The other thing is that in Canada, there is you've seen a lot of international construction companies coming to Canada in the last 10 years. Why? Because we're rebuilding all of our infrastructure. The U.S. is not doing that. On a per capita basis, there's a lot more going on in Canada in construction and engineering than there is elsewhere. So this is a hotbed of construction activity. If the, if the British, excuse me, if the European and American construction companies realize this is a great market and this is where they need to be, maybe the tech startup should figure that out too. That'd be my pitch to them anyway. Um, you also pitched people on, you know, joining the industry generally. Uh, what do you look for when you hire good people? What are the traits that uh, you think good employees or people in your company share? How do you spot them? Brains, integrity, courage, ambition, and not so much skills. You're not going to hire somebody who's never built a building to hire a great big tower, but skills can generally be trained. We want people who come here. We say to people, the purpose of this company is to, is to maximize the opportunity of everybody at this company who share among a group of people who share the same values. So we have this big debate, which is more important, character and values and brains or skills. I argue it's the former because you can train skills but it's really hard to train character and, and, and train uh, brains. We, we, frankly, we want smart people here. Uh, so that's what I would say. I would say we're a professional knowledge-based uh, company in the construction industry, and we want really smart people here. Uh, and, and uh, there's, you know, there's the old line that came out of the book, Good to Great. Uh, don't figure out where the company's going and hire smart people to get you there. Hire smart people and let them tell you where the company's going. That's what we look for. How do you spot that? Where, do you, where are you going out to find those skills? Um, we get the best uh, references because clearly it, you, you're going to hire people who are interested in some experience in construction. We just try not to put that at the top of the list. Our employees and sometimes our clients bring us the best people. We get lots and lots of resumes. We work really hard. We have people who understand social media. So we get lots of, I don't, but lots of people who apply to Elliston, who want to work for Elliston. But the best references we get are from people who know other people who want to, want to join us. Our employees bring us the best potential employees, believe it or not. And we're not, I used to be against nepotism, which is, uh, which would be surprising given that I have my job uh, arguably because of nepotism. Uh, but I didn't want a company full of people's kids. Uh, we've actually learned that if, if, if you made it at Ellis Dawn, uh, your kid, you probably brought up your, your son or daughter in a way that will enable them to make it at Ellis Dawn. And not only that, you won't let them screw up because you'll kill them. So we actually have a lot of, uh, of uh, second and third generation people here. But surprisingly, it works very well. I just want to go back to uh, the pandemic for a second. Um, I'm curious to know generally what your thoughts are on the federal government's infrastructure strategy for the pandemic, for the post-pandemic recovery, I should say. You know, building um, is typically seen as a really important part to stimulating the economy after events like this. So uh, are you encouraged by what you're hearing and seeing from, from the government? Not in the, listen, I'm not being critical of the government here. I'm not encouraged in the traditional sense. As we all know, coming out of recessions and economic interruptions in the past, uh, governments love to get um, buildings going, right? They generally take so long to get them through the planning stages that they don't come until the next boom. Uh, that's where the big term shovel ready came from. I would actually say in 2007, 2008, uh, the federal government did a great job getting projects going. There's a way they did it. I thought it was uh, terrific, the federal government and the provincial government. Uh, this time, as you know, the federal government hasn't exactly got the Canadian Infrastructure Bank up and 
running in a really dramatic way, and their infrastructure policy has been uh, more set around uh, the environment and uh, communications, you know, broadband, et cetera. I don't really have a big argument with that. Frankly, there's a lot of infrastructure work that's already going on. There's more of a shortage right now in people than there are in, in big projects. So, so I'm, I'm generally okay, but it, it's, they were doing it anyway before COVID and it's not really a response to COVID, but, I, but, I, but I'm okay with that. So I'm not going to criticize them, even though they haven't, they haven't done it in the conventional way. Is the uh, rhetoric around or commitments around um, a green recovery in infrastructure, is that something that is new, that you're seeing that's new? I know this is something that Ellis Dawn has been talking about for years now, but um, is this kind of push from the government something that you're feeling for the first time? Well, listen, in terms of, in terms of sort of rhetoric, and let's be kinder and call it uh, government priorities, by all means, in terms of pushing infrastructure uh, stimulus recovery by focusing on green, that's the first time. This is the first time that's ever happened. But again, you're seeing uh, lots of attention to uh, green buildings, to the environment. Jim Carney is saying big deals, big development deals won't go, won't be financed unless uh, unless they're focused on uh, sustainability. That's all happening independently and 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 properly. Uh, we're all in favor, and we intend to lead the way, of course. Uh, but that's all in, happening independently of COVID. The government, the federal government, of course, is being very supportive of that with what they're saying around the, the post-COVID stimulus. But to be fair, it was happening anyway, uh, and 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 all the better for it. So, so it's terrific. The, the industry has a terrible record uh, in terms of its uh, carbon footprint, but we're we're working very hard on it. Not we, Ellis Don, but we, the industry, and uh, and you're going to see a change. I don't think it's a COVID thing. I think it's a global crisis thing. That'd be my my view. Um, we only have a couple more minutes left here, and I'm gonna make my last question for you. One from the audience. Um, someone asked, "What is your biggest hope for 2021?" Huh? You know. Well, we got to get the vaccine out. We want to get back to normal. I, I just, my biggest hope is that, is that the Canadian economy in the areas that have been really damaged, maybe this is a false hope, can show, you know, I talked earlier about the buzzwords maybe, but fast food and flexible can show a real resilience. These retailers, these restaurateurs, these service industry, small business people, my biggest hope is that they can find a way to bounce back that they're not permanently washed out. That would be the key to not just prosperity, but to mental health, to, to just the kind of society we're all trying to build. That would be my biggest hope. Jeff, uh, well, thanks again for a really interesting conversation. Um, I appreciate your candor here. And David, thank you for hosting. Catherine, thank you for doing a phenomenal job moderating. You know. I have a script in front of me, Jeff, and I'm going to break a, a golden rule, and I'm not going to read it. I'm going to, I'm just going to reflect on uh, on your comments. You know, I don't say this because you graced us with your presence. I say it because it's true. Yeah, your reputation precedes you. A lot of people know Jeff Smith and the work that you do, and are very impressed and grateful for the work that you do. And I can tell you from from hearing your thoughts. You speak with a level of courage and compassion that I think we need more of in Canadian business. Uh, and it's, uh, it's encouraging to me to hear that. It's encouraging to me uh, to, to be uh, a new acquaintance of yours and hopefully a friend in the future because uh, you're saying the right things, your company's doing the right things. And you know, I'm personally moved by your reflection and ability to talk about anti-black racism. I'm gonna call it out and name it because uh, it's yeah. important and your, uh, your approach is the right one. And I hope that CEOs follow that approach as we tackle issues that need to be tackled. Uh, across our community. So thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for sharing your story and the Ellis Don story uh, and all the best in the future. Thank you very much. I'm gonna now go back to the script so that I don't lose my job uh, as chair of uh, the Canadian Club next year. Uh, I invite you all to join us on Thursday, January 21st. We're gonna have a panel of experts to talk about financial wellness. 
as we move into 2021. Uh, I also want to thank our sponsors, the Carpenters Union and KPMG, uh, for being here today. Again, our events would not be possible without sponsors like you and your generosity. And of course, to our AV supplier, uh, Van Volkenberg Communications and LiveMeetings.ca for making it all possible. Thank you for joining us. Stay healthy, stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask, and, and stay home. Okay, thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone.